for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, The Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests on the show will be director-producer Dan Fields and actress Sai Chin. Dan Fields was a resident director for Broadway's The Lion King. In Seattle, he was a resident director at the Annex Theater, and he was the assistant art director at the Williamstown Theater Festival and artistic director for Fine Silver Shows. Dan, let's go through and explain <laughs> assistant director, artistic director. Let's start with The Lion King, where you were a resident director. Yeah, that's certainly the biggest show many of us have ever have ever <laughs> seen. Uh, that was a show uh, that, of course, Julie Taymor directed. And uh, as her assistant director, from the beginning of that, uh, I was by her side through the design process and the casting process and the rehearsals. And uh, ultimately, when the show opened on Broadway, as a resident director, I maintained the show, um, cast replacements, oh. uh, tried to keep it up to the level of perfection of opening night. So you have to stay there all the time. I mean, oh, you yeah. were there every minute. I was there for every I saw the show over 500 times. But it was so great. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was. But what happens if something happens to the costumes? Do you have to make sure that you see what's going on? I'm watching all the details. I'm watching the performances. I'm watching what was happening technically to the lights and to the set where people stood on stage and uh, just trying to make sure that it's the show uh, is ha re remains how it was created originally because the performers want to experiment and explore and sometimes they can change things a lot. So. Especially if they do it every single night. Absolutely. They're performing eight times a week on Broadway and they can get a little bored. And then when a new actor, when someone leaves the show and we cast a new actor, they need to step into it as though they've always been doing it. So oh. that was the main thing I did, was, was train the new performers to uh, learn the show from the inside out, for the puppetry, the singing, the oh. acting. So you everything. needed the continuity. So if they took their role and changed it a little bit, you wouldn't have that continuity if they were being replaced. Exactly. Yeah. Then you did conversations with my father, Dan, under Dan Sullivan, who was also, who is also a very well-known director, just yeah. like Julie. This was Julie's first big that thing. That was her wasn't first it? breakout show. Yeah, she's been uh, well known in, uh, especially in New York, but also in the sort of world theater scene for, for a while, especially for her masks and puppetry. But she's right. also directed a lot of opera and had done a short film. So uh, The Lion King was her first Broadway show, oh, and then she just came out with the, the film Titus with right. Anthony Hopkins that was her first uh, major full-length feature. Right. So, so um, But Dan Sullivan was a name that we knew in Los Angeles. Yeah, he directs here a lot. I actually assisted him years ago in Seattle. Uh, he was used to be the artistic director of the Seattle Repertory Theater. Is that where Conversations with My Father was? That's where it began, oh, so before I it went see. to Broadway. So okay, I worked on I the see. original production of that. And then did you go to Broadway with it? Uh, no, I wasn't in New York yet at the time. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, yeah. See. I assisted in the regional theaters for a while while I lived in Seattle and directed my own productions there before I moved to New York. So that, those were resident directors. Yes. Ships. Now, assistant directorship, Randy Newman's Faust, where you were an assistant director. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of the same <laughs> kind of thing I did for The Lion King. It's just a different title. You're, you're oh. there to, to totally get the back of the director, make sure that the director has every bit of information they could possibly need, uh, oh, rehearse, uh, rehearse people when the director can't be working with them, and maintaining the quality of the show. Same thing. Yeah, it's just a yeah. different title. Yeah, kind it is. Of. You know, in New you York, you got everyone wants a different title in New York. But so. oh, so when it went to New York, it was Michael Grief. Greif? Michael Grief. Uh -huh. Michael Grief. He's uh, known for. He's the director of Rent. That was his big hit. And then you did The Seagull with like a really um, top notch. Yeah. Celebrity. <laughs> that was the first show I assisted for Michael. Uh, that was at the Williamstown Theater Festival um, back in 94. And uh, Christopher Walken played Tregorin, um, Blythe Danner played Arkadna, and Gwyneth Paltrow, who was just a 20 year one, 21 year old 
relatively unknown at the time, played uh, played Nina in that production. You um, had major stars. Yeah. Di- was it difficult working with them? No, not at all. It was it was a theater project that everyone loved to be doing. Uh, it was, it's such a, an amazing text, the Chekhov play. So. D- do you have any um, um, things that stand out? that are different working with, say, motion picture people as opposed to people who are on the stage? Only one thing. <laughs> uh, film actors need to be reminded that they need to project their voices to fill the theater. Oh, is, oh. Uh, some of them do. You know, Blythe Danner is, is, comes from such a great tradition in the theater. You could hear every word she said in the back of the house. But uh, sometimes you need to remind people that, that uh, there's not a, a camera close to them and they need to they need to speak up. That's interesting, though. Because but they're, I, but, but uh, performers know how to work with other actors, no matter whether it's on film or on the stage. So. Do you, do you uh, see a difference between actors on film uh, about what they expect from the director? Do they have a different expectation? I think that, for, at least from my experiences, in, uh, in film the actors seem to get left alone more often, oh. where there are so many technical things that a director has to focus on, from the camera to the lighting to the focus to hitting their marks, uh, that the acting gets left up to the actor, that's what they do. Where <laughs> in, the, in the theater, we're really creating every beat, every moment uh, together collaboratively. And you don't stop. On stage, you don't get to stop, right? Right. Right. So I wonder how that affects the timing. I guess you just, yeah. when you're an actor, you just get into it. Yeah, and especially in a, in a play like this Miller play where it's, it's, it, the language is, is realistic even though it's also elevated and, and lyrical, uh, the actors are, are trying to live inside that character for the entire two hours of the show. Uh, they're not stopping and starting to, you know, do multiple takes. They're really trying to be that person for that amount, for of, that time amount of time on stage. Well, yeah. that must that must uh, be the same thing that happens in all the plays that that you've been doing. Yeah. yeah. The um, the the last uh, hyphenated after your name hyphenated is artistic director of Fine Silver. Uh huh. That's a production company. Yeah. I, last uh, last year, I finally started my own theater production company mm. in New York, Fine Silver Shows. And uh, we did our first production last summer. Uh, Roald Dahl has written many short stories. Uh. He's famous for his children's stories, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But he also wrote some very sharp, kind of nasty adult short stories. Really? And I adapted them for the stage and did a, a production. Because when, last when I saw Roald Dahl on your bio, I was thinking that you were doing children's that's, theater. That's what a lot of people thought. So they were quite <laughs> surprised. And actually, some people brought their kids to see oh. these shows. And there's, you know, there's, there's people having affairs, and there's someone getting killed, and they're, they're really dark kind of twisted story so we had to warn them you know for their the eight, other, eight and nine year old kids the other side of Mr. Dahl right? exactly well um, even in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory he's got a kind of dark sense of humor don't you think if you look for it yeah. I think if you're just like oh here we go it's yeah. okay but yeah. when you start looking for uh, the underpinnings I, th- I guess that's what happens yeah and he really can ride it the other way yeah. and it made good theater it, it, it always does, doesn't yeah. it, when you yeah. have some kind of twist? Yeah. Uh, your Fine Silver Productions then came together with Antius uh-huh. Productions yeah. in Los Angeles, yeah. where they did an Arthur Miller play. Um, that's what we're working on right now, and uh, co-produced it with the Antius company, uh, which is a Los Angeles-based classical repertory company. Uh, they made their mark uh, a few years ago with the Wood Demon and the Mark Taper Forum, which was oh. a, an early Chekhov play that they adapted. And uh, they've got a lot of the members of this company are faces you've seen on TV, film, and commercials, but they all come from a great tradition of theater, classically trained, great theater backgrounds. So we teamed up. And, Is that uh, how, why you found why you went with them? Yeah, yeah. And you and found the, the Arthur Miller play. Yes. You found it's it's. It uh, hasn't been produced for 55 years. Yeah, or in this over country, 50 at least. years. It was. It was actually Arthur Miller's first play produced on Broadway when he was 29 years old, uh. and uh, it closed after four performances, which was not a total flop. Often in the 40s, cl- shows would run for one or two nights, but it certainly wasn't a hit, and uh, it never got published. And 
got left behind, really forgotten. There was a production in London about 10 years ago, but aside from that, everyone thinks All My Sons was his first play on Broadway, but this predates it by three years. Why did you, how did you find it then? Uh, after the London production, I was uh, working in Seattle at the Seattle Repertory Theater, reading scripts in the literary office, and someone got a hold of the place, the manuscript from London and sent it into Dan Sullivan. Oh. And he wasn't <coughs> interested in it, but uh, I read it and loved it and held on to it ever since. And I've been looking for opportunities to uh, produce it with the right group of people in the right city, with the right resources. Then finally, the, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, I, I met Arthur Miller last summer. Uh, finally met someone who knew him and introduced me, and I was able to tell him about my desire to do this play. And we sat down together and talked about the production and the ideas for it and how to evoke the fable, because it's a fable. He did give you some, some answers, didn't he? Yeah. And gave you some yeah. pointers on how it ended? Yeah. Well, he, he, <laughs> or how it he should had, have ended? He had originally written it as a novel and <laughs> couldn't sell it to a publisher. And then he turned it into a play. Uh, in the novel, the main character uh, kills himself at the, at the end of the play, uh, which is not out of the ordinary for his writing. But then he changed it and decided that the character should live in, in a sort of ambivalent state, oh. but he survives. So um, we went back and asked him this year, are you comfortable with him, with the main character surviving? And indeed he was. Oh, he did. So then you took it to the substation, Ivy substation, where I saw the play. Right. And uh, it had that kind of classic quality to it. Is, is that really why you went together with this group of actors? Yeah, it's not uh, just a completely naturalistic play. Uh, Arthur Miller's language is very lyrical and heightened and poetic at times. And uh, because it's also a fable, there are passages where there are strange coincidences that happen. So to take advantage of that, you need an actor who can speak beyond just the moment of contemporary language and, and give it oh, something I special. Oh, I see. Is that, um, I have... Um, Tell me who I have here. You can talk over what they're you've, doing here. You've got uh, the two stars of the show. Uh, on the right is Paul Gutrecht, who is the title character, the man who had all the luck, Dave Beeves. And on the left is Kelly Waymeyer, who plays Hester, who is his, the love of, of his life. And uh, Dave uh, is the luckiest man you'll ever meet. And that's the name, the man who the, had all the luck. The man who luck. had all the luck. <laughs> This guy gets everything he ever wanted in his life. When this girl's father doesn't want them to get married, something happens and he's taken out of the picture and they, they get to marry. One thing after another happens until he almost feels cursed by his good luck because it's just not normal to only have good luck. Let and me that's just, the moral dilemma. Let's do one more before we have to leave. Uh, this is Phil Proctor on the left who uh, plays da the, the man who had all the luck's father. And the brother, Amos, who's a baseball pitcher, who suffers a, a heartbreaking defeat in the play and attacks the father. Uh, and Dave tries to smooth, smooth it out because, of course, his luck is increasing, but the brother's has fallen. It's Phil, you may recognize from uh, the Fire Sign Theater. Phil's one of the members of the Fire Sign. It sounds like uh, an Arthur Miller play. <laughs> yeah. Well, fathers and sons. Exactly. Know, it does. A, a, a father who has illusions about what his son's can be and should be, uh, brothers who have very different courses in their lives and that creates conflict uh, between them and uh, individuals struggling with their place in the world, trying to understand how their actions affect their futures. Oh, very I think classic it's Arthur Miller very themes. Very classic, classic themes and yeah. also the classic theater and classic director. <laughs> Thank you, Dan Fields, <laughs> for being with us. Thank you very much, Joan. It's been a pleasure Thanks talking a to you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with actress Sai Chin. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with the Joan Quinn Profiles. We want to say welcome to actress Sai Chin, who was born and raised in Shanghai. She trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, where she subsequently launched her acting career in the West End. She had a cabaret act there, and she appeared on the BBC. Those must have been exciting times for you, Sai. Yes, very full <laughs> time. It was in the 60s, so we had a great time. Everything was happening. You were singing in the cabaret act? 
I was I did yeah, I did I did uh, singing for about three years because I had a record that was very very uh, what you call it was one uh, one of the hit records and that's why I went into cabaret but that was only a very small part of my career three you years you did Susie Wong yeah, in the West I, End. I, yeah I was the the English Susie Wong yes and did you sing in that role that's how it started because I was also asked to do the flower drum song and I couldn't do both and that's why I wanted to sing. It's a long <laughs> story and then I, I be, then I chose a song and then somebody uh, you know asked me if I want to sing it and it became a hit and that's how I did cabaret. Oh is that right? Yeah. So they expected you, you know, to when sing. you're young yeah when you're young you just do whatever and things happen to you. Did you so, do both plays then? No, I you didn't. You just did yeah, Susie Wong. Susie Wong I I had to do it for 2 years. Did you get bored? Uh, yeah, I think so. Did you? <laughs> yeah. But in those days, you had to do it. It's called the run of the contract. You can't do that now. Oh, but, mm -hmm. but you went from Shanghai and you started a life in London, I guess. Yes. Was that big? Did the Cultural Revolution uh, affect you? No, Cultural Revolution was later on. It was in the uh, 60s. So. So when I was went to England, it was early, early when I was doing Susie when it was early sixties, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> yes, when the Cultural Revolution happened in this, in sixty six, it did affect me in the sense because of my parents. Uh, my father was, uh, you know, uh, uh, the head of the artistic community, and she he was one of the main purge, uh, purges. So that did affect me. He was in the opera. He was or the yeah, head he was, of the opera. He was the uh, one. He was the superstar of uh, Chinese theater, and because of the political uh, situation, he eventually had to, you know, stop acting, and uh, there was a huge persecution. Of Did your mother also act? No. So you didn't no. come from your all your show business genes come from your father. <laughs> probably yes, probably yes. <laughs> Though my mother had a great influence on me because my mother was a very uh, um, modern woman and taught me a lot of things that most uh, Chinese mother didn't. Probably oh. not for the better. Was she was she <laughs> very risque in her teaching? No, she was not ris risque, but she ta taught me about independence. Ah, well that was important. About being uh, 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 to, to achieve as a woman. So and that is what me, you yeah, did. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think my, mo my father gave me the genes, but my mother certainly gave me the strength. I think when, I think when things like that happen, you never, I know. I think that that kind of a person never thinks that they can't succeed because they're a woman. I think you just have yes. the strength and you go ahead. Yes. And it obviously my mother proven. taught me to uh, believe in myself. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. the main thing. After London, you came to the U.S. And I think this is fascinating. You went to the Cambridge Ensemble in Boston. Yes, that was in the seventies because I wanted to do uh, a classic Western classics. So uh, it was not diff not easy for for Chinese actress in England. So I went to a, a experimental theater and I did do a lot of Western plays. But and you were also the residence uh, actor in residence at Tufts. Yeah. Then then I then I yeah then I'd start teaching and directing. Yeah. At you Tufts were University. were you a director before that? No. No. Why did you did you want to? Because it was very and? available. Because the, oh. the, it was the theater and the students and everything, and I didn't have to go and hustle, and hassle and all that. You it know. was there. Yeah. So that became a director in a kind of world natural progression, and taught acting there. You know. So and by that time, I, I had enough experience to want to know more about what acting is about, not just as an actor. But as you were teaching, mm -hmm. and obviously you were learning for yourself, did you ever perform in any uh, college performances or local no, performances? No, no, no. I was working twelve hours a day. <laughs> so I mean, I also, I was I was getting my <coughs> master degree, so I went to university uh, rather late uh, as an adult student. So I was I had a wonderful two years where I taught, directed, and did my uh, master degree, and that's enough. You know. Do you miss Boston? Uh, I don't miss the weather. <laughs> no, the weather is what's bad. I yeah. love going there. I, mm. I'm on the board of the Armenian Library and Museum of America, which is in Watertown. And of course, we pass through Cambridge all the time, and 
one of our trustees is also uh, at Tufts. She teaches at Tufts. So that was fascinating to me to think that you were there yeah. learning I, and teaching. I am very grateful to Tufts. I had the most wonderful two years. And then from there, back to London to be a star. Well, then, <laughs> no, then, I, went back, then I went to China and taught and direct. Oh, you did? Because that's the time where China opened up after the Cultural Revolution. You weren't that afraid is, to go back? Now, then I was invited to go back I by see. the other side, with the other side. And the, the, you know, it's, it's terribly complicated. I so, know. Yeah. So I was the first foreign person to go and direct and, and teach there. So that was also very rewarding. Then I went back to, to, to England again and start acting again. Take me back to China for a minute. Did, did you remember the language? When you went back, because you'd been gone. I for remember quite a while. the Shanghainese, but you know they speak Mandarin, so I have to relearn all that again. You did when you went there. Yes, but within like three months, you know, you already start to think more like a, that language. Wait, but I needed help. Did you feel any um, any of the people there feeling sorry about what had happened? Oh yeah, I mean that's yeah. why I, I, I eventually I was asked to write a the book in you know, my autobiography, Daughter of Shanghai, which is basically one third of it's about that experience. I want to read that. I didn't get a chance to read that. I don't know if you have any here in Los Angeles, but I you would like to You can get to it from the library or you can order from the internet. <laughs> you can order it. Okay, well, good, because it's I been, think it's, it's been, it's, it's, it's the, the book seems to be, you know, surviving because it's still in print and but it's also very timely. I mean, it's things that happened at a period where if you don't go back and capture it, you'll never know about that. So then you went to London. I, I didn't mean to interrupt then you, but you did Then Butterfly. I went back to acting, and I did uh, David Henry Wang's, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, M. Butterfly. M. Butterfly. And, uh, with Anthony Hopkins, he, he was starring in it, and it was a great, wonderful, that, because he, he's really a nice guy. And then I wrote, I, and I wrote my book. To, um, I, I've lived a very long. <laughs> you wrote your that. book in between. And then, and then, to cut a long story short, then uh, uh, Joy Luck Club happened, and I came to do Joy Luck Club. And uh, you left London to come to, to uh, do, Hollywood. Yeah, not not to to come and live in Hollywood. Just oh. to, you know, they asked me to do this role, so oh, I, uh, I I uh, I did this role, and uh, without thinking too much about it. The film was ex extremely successful, and then also I got a lot of attention from the critics and everything. And so then, <laughs> uh, my agent, uh, you know, kind of Hollywood door was open to me because it was never on the agenda. I never thought of coming to 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 to, to Hollywood. But but Hollywood was a natural. All this stage was a natural because you were so you didn't have any language problems. So you uh, you were able to. Well, I was always, I was always very beginning. frightened of Hollywood because I know you had to be kind of superficial and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I, 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 I just don't have that kind of patience. So Hollywood was never on the agenda. But uh. then Joy Luck Club happened, and then people, you know, the agents want to represent me, and they say, "Listen, you cannot commute from oh. London to 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 Hollywood unless you're." Uh, uh, you know, really superstar. You know, so okay. so then I ha then therefore I came to live in Hollywood. So here you and are. I've, I've been here since. And we're happy to have you. But I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> you I played a uh, really strong woman. You played Madame Mao too. Yeah, I've, I've as a woman, uh, as an actress getting gets older. Yes. If she's lucky, she, all the great parts are all strong and usually. Bad women. Bad women. Well, you were in the warrior, the woman, woman warrior. warrior. She's not bad, but she's strong and she's tough. And then now, you know, I'm here because of uh, American vacation. Uh, I'm playing another strong, tough uh, mother. Uh, although That's an she's not as, 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 as tough as Auntie Lindo. That's a, a film by Vivi Shu. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's been a big award winner, an yes. independent film. Yes. And she's a strong woman, mm -hmm. but she's not, as you say, the, as strong as the Joy Luck Club. She's not as, as, <laughs> as, as, as nasty as uh, uh, Auntie Lindo. And uh, the reason I, I accepted uh, uh, the role in uh, um, my American vacation for two reasons. One is that 
it is a story that could be of any uh, race. And that's great. I think that's yeah. what you yes. find more and mm -hmm. more now. If you have any kind of ethnic background yeah. in your story, you can just change the Yeah, because it's, it's just happened to be a Chinese family. It could be any family. Right. And also, I, I like the script very much. And it has a sequence which this, I play the grandmother nowadays, uh, grandmother. Glamorous uh, grandmother. Uh, well, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> And then I, uh, so she, she has a dream sequence of dreaming about her husband, which I thought it was really very lyrical. And the, the film has, you know, got a lot of attention and it's going to be shown in, it's, it's, it's been shown in Los Angeles, San Francisco in the theaters, and I think it's coming to New York. I think um, it it's, has that kind of quality that will be lasting. It'll it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a very gentle uh, comedy but it also has very serious moments in it. How do you find the, we, we talked about it could be anybody playing this role in uh, My American Vacation, but how I do you I don't mean anybody, nobody can no. play my role. <laughs> I'm talking about the script, the story could be any, any race. Story. Any but race. what? But what, what kind of roles do you find for Asian women? Like any other kind of roles. A lot? Well, the roles that I have had actually has a lot of variety, but one just wants m more and better, meatier, that's all. Because you played uh, with Richard Gere in a film, mm -hmm. The Red Corner. Mm -hmm. You played a judge? Yeah. Oh, well, that's another tough role, right? Another tough woman, right. real strong. So it would be nice if one could do, uh, you know, different varieties. And it's, it's coming. It's, it's just, I mean, I don't complain as an Asian actress because I think I do quite well. But I think if you really want to go on complaining, you would say that women have a less, not as good, good a time as men. men. Men usually, when they get old, they are still kissing the young girls. Women don't get to do that. You but know. do you find that in... in not that gonna, I want to kiss young men. <laughs> but we're going to put it in, say, an Asian realm. Do you find that with the men also? No, Asian realm, you... At the moment, I'm kind of playing a lot of strong uh, women roles, but usually it's a mother. I see. You know, and, and I get scripts and I, I, I would tell them, I say, look, write me. If, if it's about a strong, independent woman uh -huh. who is her own boss, I'll be much more interested. And you can do that? Yes. Well, we're glad you were with us today because we saw how strong you could be. And, uh, we're Thank looking you for forward. having me. We're looking forward to seeing you in all of your roles. You, when, when I saw you today, I thought, oh, hi, because I've seen you so much on the screen. And your background is so wonderfully varied that I thank you for being with us. Thank you. And thanks for watching us on the Joan Quinn Profiles. We'll see you next time. Bye. Keep riding. I forgot to tell you to keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 900. 17, and we'll tell you where to see Sai Chin.